giving. And so we really wanted to do something positive, not negative, and, and talk about all of the things that we are thankful for here in this office. Uh, and, and there's a lot of things going on in this office that I think would give um, reason for people in our community to be thankful. Um, we've got an incredible uh, people that are working here because they're committed and because they want to make a difference in our community, not because um, they don't have to work hard or they get paid a lot of money. Um, one of the, the things that, that we're celebrating is our waiting rooms. And, and you all, after this conference, are free to, to go upstairs to see our waiting room in the victim impact area as well as our, our waiting room outside where we make them kid friendly. And it may not sound like a big deal, but it's very difficult for us to accomplish things like this because we have no money, zero. Everybody's overworked and they don't really have time to plan and, and get involved. But this is something that we've wanted to do for a long time. And so people spent their own time, um, donated different items. We also had Target, Home Depot um, donate uh, items and worked hard. The county agreed to carpet that little area and we were able to create a, a, a space for children. Um, it's very traumatic when children have to be witnesses or, or victims of crime and they have to come into this office. Some studies show that sometimes the process, the criminal justice process that they have to go through is more traumatic than the actual offense. Um, so this is um, a way of us trying to make them feel more comfortable. Also for children that are coming with their parents, um, to make their parents feel more comfortable that their child will be taken care of and is happy and, and um, will reduce the anxiety. Again, Target helped with that Home Depot and our employees donated a lot of the items and 100% and of the work and effort that went into it. And so we're very pleased about that and, and very proud about that. And, and I should say that we also have a lot of people, a lot of partners in the community that when we need something, um, because we're a state agency and we can't pay for a lot of things, that um, Target, Walgreens, and Albertsons, places like that will, will help us. Something else that we've been proud about, and we have mentioned it, is a paperless process that is now in place, and we've been working on that for a number of years. And um, when you're, you, you can also go up on the third floor because we have a good example of tons of boxes that are just lining the hallway, and all of those papers have been scanned and are part of, um, part of what we've been trying to do. We really, if you walk around the office, uh, you can see that we don't have room for storage, uh, this available space that even the state has for our records. Um, archives is at a breaking point, and we have to schedule with them how many boxes we can put in archives way in advance. We've been doing this for about two and a half years, and um, it's been a real success. It's taken a lot of manpower to scan everything in. Uh, but it's great. Uh, we have been doing this on a limited basis because of the money. Once again, we don't have money for scanners. They're very expensive. Um, but we've been making it a priority, and we've been very successful. Backlogs are shrinking in every division. We're, we've said we want to start scanning the newer cases and work on the backlog, and we've done that tremendously. We've um, scanned approximately 30,000 cases so far. And some of these cases could even be in a number of different boxes, so they're not just little tiny files. Uh, they could be viewed by district attorney's offices statewide, which is great. All of our, our case management system uh, is, is statewide. And if I want to go back, if the media has a question, we can go back and access those files much easier. So I think that it's much more efficient. Um, other ADAs, if we get someone a repeat offender, we can go back and look at those files. So I think it does impact public safety. Um, and um, we don't have to spend the time storing files, finding places for files, uh, re-requesting documents. We, we can just access that all on the internet. I believe that on the fourth floor, that's our metro division where we prosecute misdemeanor uh, domestic violence and DWIs. There came a time when uh, some engineers came in and said, listen, you've got too many files on this floor. It's going to collapse down to the third floor. Uh, and so this is, is going to um, negate any issues with that. So we're really proud. It's taken a lot of money. It's taken a lot of effort and a lot of time. But we've managed to accomplish it really with no additional resources. So when we don't have the money, uh, we can be more creative and figure out ways to become more efficient. And this is a, an example of Causes that we support. Everybody knows that we work here. 
I keep saying we work here very hard. We work here uh, for probably less pay than anyone could get in a private sector. But we also do a lot of other things in the community. Um, so we do quarterly blood drives. And I think sometimes we might even do more than quarterly. Last week, I mean, Kayla, correct me if I'm wrong, there was a young boy that was going to have surgery and it was going to, actually I wonder if it was the surgery that was covered in the paper um, to remove a tumor and he was going to need a lot of blood. I, it may, may be. But, uh, and so all of the blood that was given that day was going towards that, that young boy. Uh, and we had a lot of people sign up and do that. We participate in all sorts of fundraisers, the, the um, Susan G. Komen Walk, the MAD Walk, which of course is related to DWI, the Suicide Prevention, Light the Night Walk, which was several weeks ago. And we participate in that. Oftentimes we get teams to, to do that. Um, law Enforcement Appreciation Events, Metro Teen Court Public Safety, uh, New Mexico State Bar, we do all sorts of things, the Bernalillo County Multidisciplinary Team, uh, UNM Law School Camp, and most of these are just volunteer. And, and most of these, we end up working evenings or weekends to participate, but we think it's really important that we give back to the community and more than just what we do during the workday. Various churches and schools, Crime Stoppers, um, youth, support, youth Sports, the Albuquerque Rescue Mission, the Albuquerque Humane Society, we're really here to serve the community in more ways than what we do in our 8 to 12 hour workday. Red Cross dollars for disaster campaign was really successful. Our office got really involved and in fact our divisions ended up competing with each other. The total raised by all the state of New Mexico employees was about 11 million. We raised about 200, $2,300 worth and that's 21%, oh 11,000, I'm sorry not 11 million, 11,000. So we raised about 21% in this office of the entire amount raised in the state of New Mexico. Um, so that, that's just, I think, huge. And, and we, do, we do it by having fun, too. Um, the competition made it a lot more fun. Um, so those are some of the things that, that we're doing. I think it's important for the public to know uh, that we're not working on their behalf uh, just during, during the daytime. And we're trying to make this upbeat. I know it's not real sensational. You know, nobody got murdered. We're not going to be talking about things like that. But it's, it's really important, and whenever I go out and speak to groups, people, people come up to me and say, God, it's really nice to know that, that people in your office are like that, that they're doing that, that they really care, that they're really, it's kind of humanizing them. We often say that, that people work harder, they get paid less, and if they make a mistake, it's going to be on the news, right guys? Um, but if they do something great, it's probably not going to be on the news. And so this is a way of supporting them. I'd like to also talk about um, two other things in addition to that, and this is just the beginning. We'll have a follow-up. Uh, I'm sure you all know about the new uh, CMO, the, the case management order that the Second Judicial District Court has imposed that will become effective on February 2nd. It's going to change the way we do business in District Court. It's going to result, hopefully, in a speedier resolution of cases. Um, there's been times that it feels like the, the process is so slow that um, justice isn't really being done, and you have to question that. Um, we've talked about, and, and last week I addressed with the media some issues with that CMO. Um, hopefully we will be, we're hoping to have a press conference in, in January before it becomes effective on February 2nd. And I'll talk about some of the issues, some of the challenges, some of the problems, um, and have APD participate in that. One of the greatest challenges we see is that we've got to give discovery at, um, at arraignment. Normally we've got several weeks. And also they're saying, uh, or, or, or demands, that if a document is created, five days from the time it's created, we have to have it in defense counsel's hands. We might not even know it exists, but it has to be in defense counsel's hands. And, and if we don't succeed at that, possibly that evidence could be suppressed. Um, which could be detrimental to some real serious cases. And it's my understanding they're not going to discriminate if it's a homicide case or a child abuse case or whatever. So uh, this is going to be a huge issue. It's going to be ongoing. We're going to try to talk to the media, be really honest, so that when things do happen, it, it won't
won't be a surprise. Um, we're going to give it 150% uh, if we can to make sure that nothing bad does happen, that we're in compliance as, as best as we can be. Um, but I'm sure that everybody appreciates there will be things that happen that will make us all um, unhappy. We did receive a letter from the AG's office today in the Jonathan Mitchell case, and I don't know if you all are familiar with that. It's a young man that um, was shot and killed. Uh, he was in his garage, shot at a car that was passing by, and that individual shot back. And we were asked to look at that case. We've had a number of protests, and it's become very controversial when we said it was a case of self-defense and that we could not prosecute. Um, Donnie Pearson. We had sent that case to the AG's office in an abundance of caution, although we reviewed it in our office and had a lot of people um, with uh, a lot of years of expertise to review it as well to see if we were missing anything. We've met with the family on one or two occasions and I've been in contact with a number of people um, that are acting on behalf of the family. And um, anyway, the AG agreed to look at that and to again see if we were missing anything. A young man lost his life, a, a war veteran, and we wanted to make sure that uh, he was getting our best efforts. Uh, in that letter, the AG's office basically concludes um, that they agree with our reasoning and, and um, agree with the law. And so at this point, um, we will not be pursuing that case. I think we've said that several times, but the family <coughs> keeps coming up with additional requests. Also, APD invested that case, but the family wanted the uh, state police to look at it. So the state police looked at it, reviewed it, came to the same conclusion the police department did, and the feds looked at it. The family went to the feds and said, you've got to do something, this is a violation of civil rights, and they declined to do anything, saying that they did not deem there to be any violation of civil rights. So hopefully we will be able to, um, obviously the tragedy um, for the family will never end, but in terms of, of any kind of legal case, we'll be able to conclude that at this point in time. So I stand for any questions if y'all have any questions. And we'll be happy to walk you around the office if you're interested in seeing any of the areas that I spoke about.